I, I've always had a, an issue with experts, particularly if I've been in a debate or whatever on the internet and I'll be saying whatever I'm saying, and somebody will start off as an expert, comma. And it's exactly the same when people come up to me in the street and they go, I'm an honest person. You think, oh, my God, I better check my pockets. You've probably stolen from me. You know, it's like, well, you don't, if you're an expert, I'll establish that through talking to you. You don't need to put a label. People will try very quickly to drag you into their domain-specific type language because all of their philosophy and ideology works in this different language. But if you break it down to pure English and go, what do you actually mean? What 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 do you actually mean if I sit here just now? Explain that to me, that weird thing that you're talking about. And that could be a zero knowledge proof in the blockchain world that everybody talks about and you say, how's that work? Uh, the blockchain itself, it's like, how's that work? And the blockchain itself is a data structure. So it's like a, a list of transactions and you're adding to that list the whole time. And that's all that you're doing. It's this centralized data structure. So everybody on that blockchain network has to agree to that centralized data structure. If you look anywhere in nature, you won't find this centralized data structure. So we all go on about, oh, that's great, it's decentralized money. It is decentralized money in that people can transact with the blockchain from all over the world without people interfering with them. They can transmit money back as long as they're depending on this centralized data structure, which is maintained by these these miners. So it's a sort of decentralized network, sort of anonymous network stuck on a central data format that everybody has to agree. And it's almost like if you imagine an ant colony or a colony of birds or whatever saying, right, okay, we better go for our next meal. Hang on, let's check with every other flock of birds in the whole country and the whole planet to see what the last meal was doesn't exist for very good reason. And that's why, like, for a peer-to-peer -peer network, like, when we're doing that with autonomy, that you say, well, you can't use a blockchain. You can't have, like, 40 billion nodes or whatever coming back to one central place and saying, what do we do next? Uh, one central data structure. They can't do that. They have to act individually. Money is a bit like time. Money is something that us, we humans have got. No other creature we know of. Even people in Star Trek don't have money. Uh, so money is an unusual thing. Bitcoin works for money and it's not a totally natural system. There is this complete agreement with where are we in the money chain? Where's the transactions? So it works in a decentralized way for money. It's an unnatural uh, data structure. But then when you're starting to look at things like data or communications between people or a lot of other things that we simulate in software, like, particularly communication and knowledge sharing, they're all quite natural. Like, we've shared knowledge ever since a couple of cavemen grunted each other and smacked each other with a club or whatever. There's a natural thing that we do, which is talk, communicate, write things down, pass it on, that word gets about. That natural process doesn't fit in with the unnatural process that is Bitcoin, which is for an unnatural system of money. When you're looking at like a decentralized system for people to act in the natural way that people act, like communicate and feed themselves and work and, and whatever, a blockchain won't work. So if you, if you take blockchain away and say, that works for money, money's a totally unnatural thing, but that works for it, it works really well. Uh, in terms of decentralization of other things like communication and data and information and whatnot, you need something that is actually decentralized and doesn't have an unnatural core piece of data that we all have to agree on. So that has to be segregated. And this is why I'm uh, not so taken with projects that build systems that aren't monetary systems on a blockchain, because a blockchain is particularly good for a monetary thing. Uh, you can take 
the monetary part of a blockchain and add it on to a decentralized system and say, well, for the money part of this communication or gaming network or whatever, we can nick into a blockchain every so often if we need to do this unnatural thing about paying each other. There are much better ways to do it, which could be completely decentralized, but they are not yet tested in the wild. Uh, I think we've got people who are definitely going to be working on that kind of thing. That would be like our native token. I think it would be significantly better than a, a blockchain because it's not centralized. But at the moment, my focus is we need to make sure that we have actual, true decentralized systems. And I think the future of decentralized systems may not even depend on that money aspect being connected to it. I think that might go away. I've, I've got a feeling that that will go away. What gets me excited is having more tools to investigate more stuff like electricity, you know, we all say we need more electricity, we'll burn more coal or more gas or create nuclear thing. You know. But electricity sort of came up with well, Henry Volta and all these people. But then who is the guy with the cage? Faraday in the Royal Society. He he put a magnet past some copper and a charge came out of it. He didn't light a bulb because Edison and Tesla did the bulb later. So he, he created electricity anyway. And uh, that was magnetism going by a copper wire, or maybe a copper coil. So all of our sources of energy, like burning things and heating things up and steam turbines or solar panel or, or whatever, is to create electricity. But what if there's another form of energy that we haven't even seen? What makes humans isn't how much they know, uh, I don't think. Don't know what it is, but something separate from that. It's the whole explorer thing. Would an AI explore the way we do? I don't know if it would. Uh, what drives us to explore, we don't know that either. But that's what we do. We have got this exploding thing. How does humanity not just kill itself at any point in time or completely stand still? And when you look into it, it's all because somebody went against the community. Actually, that's what happens. Like People go against it and there's like, a bit of backlash, and it's like, oh my God, can't believe this is happening. And then it's like, oh yeah, now we're here. We can never go back to where we were. That was rubbish. We're in a brilliant place now. And it, it seems that humans need that. We need this sort of, you know, collectivism where we all think we're all like equal, we're all the same. We can, and every so often you need somebody to just go bump, move forward a little bit. What we know about uh, material science, what we know about the planet, what we know about other animals and really other organic things, is just going to explode. If you pick up a, a spade of soil just now, we know less than 10% of what's in that soil at the moment, with all of our expert intelligence. Well, AI will come along and just tell us everything that's in it. When I'm bringing wood in, when I'm bringing wood in from the the woodpile there to put in the fire, you know, say to the, the apprentice here, you know, this is E equals MC squared. And they're like, what, what, what? And I was like, yeah, this is really heavy, this. But once I've burnt it, all the energy comes out of it. You can lift the dustpan out in one finger, and, you know, but you can't lift this bag of wood that I'm going to burn. So that's the energy, that's mass being transferred into energy. And this is what Einstein was talking about, but times the speed of light squared. And then, you look at the speed of light and you say, well, speed of light is this limiting thing. Well, is it limiting? It's only limiting if relativity is right. Relativity is not proven. Those are sort of things that I get fascinated with. There's lots and lots of stuff out there that we don't know. We don't know what energy is. We don't know what gravity is. We don't know. And we can explore much more with much better tools. Ben, who, who like, works in the robot lab here, which... At night, I'll go in and like do stuff in there. I went into him the other morning, and I was like, you know, I was wondering how many words are in this Weetabix, and he's like, what, what, what are you talking about? I was like, yeah, like, so you you run out of words eventually, but if you eat a Weetabix, you'll you'll have more energy, you'll have more ability to speak, you'll be able to have, 
some more words, okay? So there's some amount of words in this wheat bix And then, you know, so what is an energy? We don't know what energy is. So when you look at that wheat bix or something, it's like, how many words is in it? It's actually a valid question. And then and he was like, what, what, what? And I said, well, and then if I tell you something, Ben, like something interesting, let's see, oh, coal, coal in the planet, there's a coal scene that lasts 50,000 years. And when we run out of coal, we can't make any more. There's just one seam of coal, and that that's it, and it's all around the, the whole planet. And the reason that coal exists like that is when plants started growing, like all the fungus was able to eat the plants and degrade them down, a tree came along, and basically the fungus went, what the hell's that? I have no idea what to do with it. And the trees lay dormant and then went down and got compressed uh, under great pressure and then create a coal seam. But after 50,000 years, the fungus evolved and went, hey, we can eat the tree now, so they can eat the tree. So now fungus can eat trees, so because of that, there's a 50,000-year seam of coal, and there'll never be any more coal because we've got bacteria that can degrade a tree. So these words that are in my Vitabix, I've eaten, I've now said some of them, you've heard them, they now reside in your brain. That takes up a little bit of matter in your brain. So some of the mass from this Weetabix went all the way through me into your brain and stays there. And uh, those are sort of things that I get fascinated with. It's an interesting thing where I think a lot of people do hold the free market as a really good way to run things. But then if you think about AI, there's a really kind of interesting experiment here. They have a thing called a reward function. It's like so, and that's the paperclip problem. If you give the AI the reward function that's got to make as many paperclips as possible, it will it will go through all the steel and everything, and then start working out that humans are in the way, and we can get rid of them so we can make more paperclips, and it fills the world up with paperclips, and we are all gone. The reward function is interesting because that's where the sort of technology goes into psychology and, and whatnot. So if you had something that was very, very intelligent and we equate that to being life, which I don't totally know if I agree with, but for people who believe that the free market totally is what can make the world work, what would happen is if you gave an AI as its reward function, its only goal in life, free market, make profit, it would basically destroy us all quickly. It would take all the profit, it would kill the economy. It's interesting because even the likes of Abu Dhabi about two weeks ago have now introduced AI into their government structure. I don't know at what level it's came in, but they have now passed laws that AI are involved in the decision making. You can't take it out, you've got to go through AI. We know 96% of scientific journals have got errors in them, but we teach them to children as though they're all truthful. And there's all these books and there's all... And that's before they're supposed to be unbiased. That's before they get to the biased things about what people think. An interesting thing would be is if you introduced an AI, like a, a robot-type AI, a, an embodied one, and actually kept it away from human data and said, you discover the world, but give it enough that it could communicate in English to you, but don't let it have any of our data. There was a story there recently, I don't know how true it is, but one of the open AI models, somebody asked it, if you could be any animal, what would you be, thinking there'd be a human? And it chose gorilla, because it was a more interesting life. I think it would be interesting if you could get an AI without our data, would it come up with something different from electricity to power everything. You, you hear people, Elon Musk talks about it, first principles, uh, first principles thinking. Is that first principles based on maths? Is it based on like Newtonian physics? Or is it based on quantum physics, which is an unproven thing? And it's all theory, the theory of quantum the theory, because it's not a law, because we can't prove it. So first principles really might be go all the way back to Right, we're on a planet, don't even know how to make fire, nothing, learn everything. And learn everything 
over and over again and see what happens. We're training these AI models on data that we know is definitely flawed. We're telling it over and over again, two and two equals five, two and two equals five, two and two equals five. Two plus three, it does equal five. Uh, in our sort of world, two things and three things and they're all equal, which is impossible because you can't have any two things equal in space and time. All mathematics worked when we thought that the sun went round us and we were flat, we were a flat planet. All math still worked with this mathematic side of things we make fit. And if, if it doesn't fit, we stick in a constant, like the cosmological constant or the speed of light constant. It's like, this doesn't work. Well, it works if we put that number in. Oh, we'll put that number in, call it after a famous person, and then we do. And that's not really very clever, I don't think. So there might be a completely different way of looking at the world. So even infinity, though, there's an interesting thing about infinity, which is people talk about, and some mathematicians have went mental thinking about it, like institutionalised mental thinking about infinity. Like Cantor, when he came up with all the set theory, he had to go into a mental institution for a while. So people have these arguments about, oh, is, is there different infinities? Is there one infinity and it's all the same? Like zero being zero what? Zero skyscrapers or zero fingers or... Zero makes everything the same. So you could have two skyscrapers, one skyscraper, zero. But when you get to zero, it's the exact same zero, zero, like trees, but you can't add a tree on. Ultimately, that's what I think the LLM stuff is. It's that stepping stone to the next level of really being able to be curious and to have the space to be a little bit curious. The knowledge part will be taken over by AIs that they'll be able to do lots of stuff. One thing that they can do is pattern recognition. Something I'm looking at is get a big AI with a great big context window and feed the smallest AI you can possibly get into the context window and say to the big one, you work it out because we don't have a clue how this works. And they'll probably work out. So you get a big AI to work out a small AI, the small AI then make it self-learning. And then, in fact, I wrote up a thing for Ben the other day in the workshop about that. And the bottom of it, it was all the steps for continued... Uh, open-ended learning, so a self-improving AI. And it, the last step I put was run, <laughs> exclamation mark, just, just go away. Do not switch on the internet and run. 